In Pilgrim's Progress, you might remember the story of a dreamer who dreamed a dream, who relayed this dream to Pilgrim on his way and told him how he dreamed of Christ coming. There was a great noise. The rocks were rent. The atmosphere was of a storm. And he said, Pilgrim said, Oh, glorious day. But the dreamer said, Oh, no. Oh, dreadful day. He said, Why is that? said Pilgrim. Because he left me behind. What we understand of the gospel and of Christ here today, or what we learn of it, will determine our future tomorrow. The coming of the Messiah manifest in the heart an experience in him that must be realized now in the present time just before the coming of Christ in reality we need to understand how that can happen what we need to be so we truly can be excited about his coming it won't be a fearful day many people are fearful for death for the coming, for the judgment. We need to be awaiting. And some people will be waiting in expectation and they'll be sorrowful and disappointed because they were not working the works of God. Yet they spoke in his name. Let it be for us a blessed day. Does this scene remind you of your life experience or so-called Christian experience? Do you know if you are saved? Can you answer with firm conviction, yes? What we are alluding here to is the Christian experience is often for some as a mirage. You can see something in the future, but you never quite make it there. And when you think you have arrived, it's nothing in your hands. There's a conflict of interest. Look here in Romans 7.19. Paul identifies with our experience, but people like to use the words of Paul to their own destruction, as Peter says. For the good that I would, I do not, but the evil which I would, not that I do. What's wrong here? For we know that the law is spiritual, but I am carnal, sold under sin. Here's a man enslaved in sin. It tells us so plainly, but people would paint the picture otherwise, because their life experience has not been as it ought to be. The culture around us, the music, the television, the media, is all to put us under sin, sold under sin. There is something that we can identify with. Do you always do what is right? This verse obviously has in mind someone whose heart is right towards God. The person knows what is right and has a deep desire to do so, but commits acts that conflict with that desire. This statement is not true. Notice what it says in red, what I've put here, because this person's heart is not right towards God. Be not fooled. He that doeth right things is righteous if his motives are made clean if he is made clean through the word which word was spoken to the disciples which is given to us and the Holy Spirit is also working in the life if we have not conflicting messages from media television but from God's word then our hearts desires and thoughts can all be made right with God the devil says, this is something you can identify with. You can identify with me because you cannot do what is right all the time. This is Satan's speech. While our desires and choices towards sin conflict with God's moral standard, we have a need of supernatural power to bring us in line with his standard. Conflict of interest ends when we give our life to the Spirit of God. Our work is primarily relational and priority of time and interest. A decision must be made to be fully consecrated to God. 
to touch the hem of the garment, that moral law, to come in contact with that, to have our mind and thoughts, the law, the frontlets between our eyelids are to be with his law in mind. John 10, 9 I am the door by me. If any man enter in, he shall be saved and shall go in and out and find beautiful, green, rich pastures which are full of mercy, peace, loving kindness, gentleness, all those things which Jesus made beautiful. Because the head is sick, some people have a misconception of this. They think of themselves as good people. They do some good things. But the Bible tells us the reality. The head is sick. The whole body is sick. With putrefying sores. Look at Isaiah chapter 1. This is the experience of humanity. You're either on one side or the other as you make that decision at the door. Revelation 3.20 Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come in to him and I will sup with him and he with me. To him that overcometh will I grant to sit with me in my throne, even as I also overcome and am set down with my father in his throne. We cannot possibly imagine what that means, but the promise is there. Can you imagine to have a conversation with God the Father and his son in the throne? But We need a mind that's right before we can do that. That's why we're here on the testing ground. We need to have a mind that is mature that is pure, that is holy, made clean, before we can do this. And that is what the overcoming is all about. Let that mind be in you, which was in Christ Jesus. Then we can sit down with Jesus in his throne. What a beautiful promise he gives to us. Undeserving. Yet he gives us this promise to sit down with him and the Father, to be part of the family of God, this beautiful promise. We thank you, Lord, for this. A decision must be made again and again as there is a progress in the development of thoughts and feelings until those thoughts and feelings, as we follow the commands of God, it will require resistance. We will have to resist the devil because he does not like to lose his victim he claims them as his own, but our decision must be made and again and again. Persistence, ever persisting, ever in prayer, using the word of God until the time our thoughts and feelings are one with him. And as naturally as the sun and the flower turns towards the sun, so it will be that we will turn towards the sun of righteousness. Has God alienated himself from us? No, only if we choose it to be so. John fourteen eighteen, I will not leave you comfortless, I will come to you. John fourteen twenty one. He that hath my commandments and keepeth them, he it is that loveth me, and he that loveth me shall be loved to my Father, and I will love him and will manifest myself to him. That is my favourite verse. Judah said unto him, not Iscariot, Lord, how is it that thou wilt manifest thyself to us and not to the world? Jesus answered and said unto him, If a man love me, he will keep my words, and my Father will love him, and we will come unto him and make our abode with him. If we were to overcome, if we are to overcome, to sit on the throne of God with him one day, we must love him by keeping his commandments. And then the Holy Spirit will be manifest to the life. The thoughts and feelings will be changed as we become clean through the word. Romans 2.13 For not the hearers of the law, said Paul, are just before God, but the doers of the law shall be justified. What a promise is given for us 
here in these verses. Not the hearers of the law are just. Many would say otherwise and they twist the words of Paul to their own destruction to say that we cannot perfectly keep the law of God but this is not the gospel of Jesus Christ. A sanctified life there is evening and morning sacrifice relying on the merits of Christ's atoning blood but as we move through the sanctuary our experience will change. All is administered by Christ our High Priest, not by an earthly priest. There is only one mediator, it says, between God and that is the man, Christ Jesus. The New Testament was established on the Old Testament, holy place. By faith we receive the bread, food from heaven. By faith we receive the Holy Spirit, which lighteth all men and women. By faith our petitions ascend through Christ our High Priest to the throne of God. And this is, if you want to look at this, be sure of this, look at Hebrews. Look at Hebrews 1, chapter 1 to 8 and start reading through it. Or at this point of time, if you want to look at Hebrews 1, sorry, Hebrews 8 verse 1 you'll see that Paul has a summary of the things which he had spoken of, that Christ is a high priest of the temple in the heavens of which man did not pitch, but God pitched. And this is life eternal, that they might know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent. Learning how to live a beautiful life. At the end of life's journey, the requirement of all is this, willing to be led by the perfect will of God, that after the test of faith has finished her work, living a life that obeys God's moral law, exemplified by the Beatitudes, that is following the life of Christ as he lived it on earth, it will be, I delight to do thy will, O my God, yea, thy law is within my heart. Life will really at that point have meaning and purpose. A life work should begin here. We should know what we can do to be part of that life work that will go into eternity. Faith and works become a non-issue when we become immersed in Christ. It is an issue of conflict for the degenerate heart. Faith and works. But the two come together trust faithfulness means that we do something no the objective is to take a hold of Christ that is what we need to do faith will not save us unless we've taken hold of Christ actually faith is nothing it is just the vehicle by which Christ is taken hold of Matthew 13:45 Again the kingdom of heaven is like unto a merchant man seeking goodly pearls who when he had found the one pearl of great price went and sold all that he had and bought it Christ is that pearl of great price The result should be intense hatred for sin in the renewed heart there is hatred of sin and a determined resistance against it no minister is prepared to labor intelligently for the salvation of souls unless he is endowed by the Holy Spirit, unless he is feeding on Christ and has an intense hatred for sin. So if a minister is giving a false gospel that we can live with sin or can't overcome altogether, then they are not prepared for the salvation of souls and are leading them in false paths. Romans 6.22 But now being made free from sin and become servants to God, ye have your fruit unto holiness and the end everlasting life. 1 John 3.9 Whosoever is born of God does not commit sin, 
for his seed remaineth in him, and he cannot sin because he is born of God. Are mistakes made? Yes. John tells us to to renew our walk in Christ if we should fall. But this should not be a condition that is done and experienced time and time again. We need to learn, step up to the plate, renew the heart, give our life to God and move forward. Now we've mentioned this but it's good to see the verse, 1 John 2, one because we can often become discouraged but we need to know what the goals are and where we have to head to a person who's never jumped out of a plane will be scared they've never experienced what it is to um, to parachute down to the ground just giving you an, an example we having a heart and desires and affections alienated from God because of the culture in which we live because of decisions that we have not made that have not been for God or we have not understand the word fully we need to have a new experience something we've never felt experienced before so we need to take the word on faith on trust we need to jump out we need to be taken in the wings, as it were, of an eagle. The wings of a saviour who will bring us safely to the place he has prepared for his people. 1 John 2, one. My little children, these things write I unto you that ye sin not. And if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. When somebody's trying to get over cigarette smoking that's a physical sin against the body they may have to over and over again try and try and try but God is there to help us he understands our weakness he understands the surroundings and the temptation but let us not give up until we have accomplished that which God would have for us and experience those thoughts and feelings like we never have before that God can give to us. Revelation 22.11 He that is unjust, let him be unjust still. And he that is filthy, let him be filthy still. And he that is righteous, let him be righteous still. And he that is holy, let him be holy still. Remember what Paul said in Romans 2.13 only the doers of the law shall be justified for it's in their minds to do so so we're coming to a time where there will be a decision for eternity for those people on the earth before Christ comes beyond that point nothing will change holiness on the side of Christ righteousness a society of people who respect one another, who are helpful, loving and obedient. They work by the law. There's no chaos going on out there. You can walk down the street safely. And God is clear about the conditions for entry into heaven. Blessed are they that do his commandments, that they may have a right to the tree of life and may enter in through the gates into the city. He makes it very plain. Those who are living upon the earth when the intercession of Christ shall cease in the sanctuary above are to stand in the sight of a holy God without a mediator. Their robes must be spotless, their characters must be purified from sin by the blood of sprinkling. We're talking here about the Day of Atonement, which um, in ancient Israel was a type of those things portraying what would happen at the end of time. Through the grace of God, and through their own diligent effort, they must be conquerors in the battle with evil. People would balk at the point, their own diligent effort. But we are to cooperate with God. And that cooperation will require something from us. When we get a true perspective on grace, 
then we can start to move ahead. Our main work to be gracious is our relationship with God by his word, by his spirit. Facing life's record can be quite a daunting thing. Revelation 20, 12, And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God, and the books were opened, and another book was opened, which was the book of life, and the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the book according to their deeds. So we look at war footage, mass slaughter, say for example the Japanese, slaughter upon the Chinese in the Second World War, little kids bayoneted through, or it could have been an onslaught in say the countries of Guatemala or the Latin American countries in recent days, slaughter going on there, or murders that are unsolved, people abused, people unjustly treated by others all of that needs to be left in God's hands but there is a judgment to be met and God will judge those things which are done unless we repent if the life is turned around and there is a sorrow for sin then God Christ will be our advocate otherwise eternal loss if it is one sin that is cherished though considered a little sin eternal loss will be the result over time in individuals had to be ready to meet their lord before death the time of the second coming a people worldwide individually but yet collectively must be ready to meet their lord this is a special event this is a time that people have never lived through circumstances a time of trouble such as never was since there was a nation the conflict between good and evil is intense but the rewards and the stakes are high we can be as Enoch it says in Genesis 5 24 and Enoch walked with God and he was not for God took him where did he take him to he took him into heaven where often his reference made to where heaven is well I've been showing a picture along the way the horse head of Orion into Orion on the opposite arm spiral of the galaxy we find Orion Was not the whole of the Bible given as a text to bring us into line with a life that measures with the life of Christ to follow his will? Yes, it was. Is it too much to ask one to keep the law, not only by letter, but by the spirit of the Beatitudes? Is that too much to ask of us? Anything that is in rebellion against its own creation must be destroyed, as it cannot fit into the intricate web of life. To the law and to the testimony, if we keep the law and have the testimony as Jesus Christ did, the law presented perfectly in his life, taking on those beautiful attributes of character, then we will have the love of God in our hearts. We want to look now how that love can be brought about into the life look at a few details you might remember here in John 6 what was said how many had been following Jesus they followed him for their temporal thoughts and ideas and that he supplied them food they thought he as the Messiah he could supply everything for them and it was for selfish motives that they often followed him and when he told them this this word was too hard for them they said they walked no more with him except you eat the flesh of the son of man and drink his blood you have no life in you 
Whosoever eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood hath eternal life, and I will raise him up at the last day. For my flesh is meat indeed, and my blood is drink indeed. He that eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood dwelleth in me, and I in him. Many therefore of his disciples, when they had heard this, said, This is a hard saying, who can hear it? Speaking here of the closeness that he had with the Father, he was expressing to his disciples the closeness that they were to have with him. To have his mind, to have his ways, everything was to become theirs. That they would be a commandment keeping people and they would walk in the way of God. Why is not the Holy Spirit been seen more powerfully present in the lives of many because they have acted as king and had a dominion over the work and mind of other people. There is to be no kingly power over God's people. They are all to be brethren. How is this being enacted? Somebody doesn't have the same ideas, we get rid of them out of our company. They are um, taken off church books. Or other ways could be we tell them what they can say or not say. And yet these people are holding the historical truths that have been brought to us from down the ages. Holy Spirit cannot work with fanaticism, it works against God, telling other people what to do and how far to go. That is the job to be applied to your own life. Organization, it's not one's work or one person's ideas. It is of a collective, of the body of Christ love for the brethren it's not just a church scene when a person turns up at the church not just when you've shown some friendship or come someone's come to your fellowship what about ringing the other person what about keeping in contact with people who need that love and support who don't have a family it's not just your family what about God's when it comes to healing Christ healed the physical and spiritual and he certainly did not represent a drug company. People are not living as they ought to. It is through the senses that sin comes in, that the mind is contaminated. People need to know that those who abuse the body here would do the same into eternity if given the chance. And they risk losing eternal life. Likewise, some risk their life by trusting themselves to the ways of men rather than putting their trust in God's ordained ways and in God himself. How will God deal with these things? Why would we run the risk? And some people are living lives that are with the world, though they don't really see it. Watching the TV, watching the news, yes, we need some of that. But this is their life, and the Word of God is some little portion over here or what we do on one day of the week, if even that. Christ said we need to eat his flesh and drink his blood, have the mind that he has, the work, the works that he did. I want to look at some other points that could cause problems in our life. Discontentment from family, social or financial things. Paul said, in all things, I've learned to be content. Whether it's a divorce, whether it's social isolation, whatever the situation, whether it's about finances, whether it's about work, let's learn in these situations the testing ground to be content. Move on. Don't blame your parents or things in the past. There may be truth in it, but we need to forgive. Sometimes 
in asking for forgiveness there will be nothing returned to us that's not what we're looking for we need to have our own minds and hearts right the blame game is just useless we need to move on we cannot go over and over the same sins we must believe that Christ is a forgiver of our sins and that he wants us to become something by moving on Christ will take care of that which we've asked for forgiveness for and recognized and asked him to help us with when there's strife Christ reviled not again when provoked we may need supernatural help in some of these areas but let's keep on working on the issues though there seems an injustice let us take the blow turn the other cheek rejoice and again I say rejoice no matter what the circumstance Paul was singing in prison I'm sure it wasn't a joy after receiving stripes so he gives us this wonderful example not gossiping evil surmising going more, coming more often from women's instinct than facts so it's not necessarily a woman but I'm giving you an example the facts must be sure before we're going to blame somebody for something or work with suspicion that is the way that Satan works we must ever think of the good of another person until the point where we cannot think otherwise and the facts are so blatant and obvious to us not treating others with confidential respect in the church they should be as our family shut your mouth about other people talking about their personal things if you want to talk about their personal things go to them and care for them and talk to them treating those who we see mistakes in as Christ would Christ was there to give them a fresh start to give them hope to help them step up life is not static all are sinners and come short of the glory of God so we're told so we have to uplift and we have to allow people to move on forgiving as we would be forgiven many are brutal with others concerning their sins and they have their own don't get caught up with people bringing you down when the lesson learned and there is a desire to move on learn the lesson move on go to Christ with that problem shut off such behavior from other people that will go on and on and on we need to move on in Christ our words should be that something to be relied on taken at one's word like they used to say a man should be taken at his word if something is said of you that's a commitment as we had the example in the New Testament where those who reneged on their commitment in word were struck dead because they sinned against the Holy Ghost those who have not the peculiar traits to which another is subjected may flatter themselves that they are better than he but place themselves in the furnace of trial and they might not endure it nearly as well as the one they censor and misjudge how little we can know of the heart of anguish of another particularly in the times in which we live these are hard times in which we live families are ripped apart there is rebellion going on there's abuse on all sides let us work with the love of Christ that healing love that he has between the people let it be that our life is full of joy and happiness as Christ would have it to be a lifestyle plan is a very good idea those habits of prayer morning and evening the middle of the day how are they going why are we falling short we need to look at that are we falling short what is the reason how is the word being enacted in our life 
Examine yourself and prove whether you be in the faith. Some habits that are for our spiritual good need to be hardwired into our brain. We can hardwire it by writing down being methodical. Yes, a Methodist approach. And then it will become natural to us. This is a hard act to follow. But as we give our hearts to Christ, we must follow. We cannot do it of ourselves. Under all circumstances, reproof should be spoken in love. Then our words will reform, but not exacerbate. We want to be reformers for Christ. We want to win through and be like him. So to be like him, we have to speak words of love when there is need for reproof. Listen carefully. When we possess true meekness and lowliness, we are so lost in Christ that we do not take neglect or slights to heart. We are deaf to reproach and blind to scorn and insult. Where does that leave us? It leaves us in a peaceful situation. We're not creating turmoils all around us. Life should be able to move on the waters though troubled, yet there should be peace, a smooth ride through troubled waters. Not only that, we need to not make shortcuts. Shortcuts will disqualify us. Abraham made such shortcuts when he thought to realize his dream to have a child and he did it through Ishmael. That caused a lot of trouble in his family because he took a concubine to himself which was not God's ideal. We have to work in a team. We're not one on our own. But our training is on our own as far as the part that we play as an elite athlete for the team. And there I am, coaching and encouraging the team. We should all be coaching and encouraging. But more than this I want to say, the coaching we need is from Jesus Christ. Morning and evening we need to be on our knees. Daniel, three times a day he prayed to God for the needs for his responsibilities. God is waiting to help us with our requests, especially for the outreach that we would do in the world. And so let us make our requests known unto God, as the Bible says. That we can reach the high goal of his intention. We can't do it without asking, without the assistance that we need. We put our own integrity in the place of Christ's integrity. We need the mind of Christ. Let this mind be in you which was in Christ Jesus. There can be no shortcuts but perfection. The mind of Christ. The perfect mind of Christ. The maturity. The courage, the meekness, everything we must ask ourselves in all matters, in relationships, in business, in family life, where our feelings are hurt and we, we want to gain something. Let this mind be in you which was in Christ Jesus. Look at Isaiah 3, particularly 10 to 26, as we have here. The righteous, they shall eat the fruit of their doing. The wicked, their reward shall be given them. And what has happened, my people? Children are their oppressors and women rule over them. There is a rebellion against the natural order of things. What makes a family? What makes up partners? how a family conducts themselves. They're lost in humanistic and evolutionary ideas. O oh my people, they which lead thee cause thee to err and destroy the ways of their paths. 
There was a role given to man. There was a role given to women. And there was a place given to children. The Bible clearly speaks about that. The Lord standeth up to plead, and standeth to judge the people. The Lord will enter into judgment with the ancients of his people. What mean ye that ye grind the faces of the poor? The daughters of Zion are haughty. They walk with stretched forth necks and wanton eyes, walking and mincing as they go, and making a tingling with their feet. Does this not describe the vanity that is in the world today, in those who are rich and increased with goods? The Lord will smite thee with a scab, the crown of the head of the daughters of Zion, and the Lord will discover their secret parts. In that day the Lord will take away the bravery of their tinkling ornaments and their calls and around tires like the moon, the chains, the bracelets, the mufflers, the bonnets, the ornaments of the legs and the headbands, the tablets and the earrings, the rings and the nose rings. You see it's just all the same. The changeable suits of apparel, mantles, the glasses, the fine linen, the hoods, the veils shall come to pass instead of a sweet smell it shall be a stink. Instead of a girdle a rent and instead of a well set baldness instead of stomacher a grinding of sackcloth burning instead of beauty the men shall fall by the sword the mighty in war her gates shall lament and mourn and she being desolate shall sit upon the ground this is the state we find ourselves in and it was interesting, particularly it says here that children are their oppressors. Children walk the street today at incredible hours with nobody to rule over them. They are ruling over people. And women rule over them. Over women and children rule over that which God did not ordain in a situation where equal rights is meant to be the go people are scared to come out at night there can be some unpopular messages from the scripture that don't suit society such as this submitting yourselves one to another in the fear of the Lord wives submit yourselves unto your own husbands as unto the Lord unpopular message in this time of women's liberation women have felt like they're on a string submission is a hard thing for them to do it's not popular but the command is there for the husband is the head of the wife even as Christ is the head of the church we want to submit ourselves to Christ don't we Therefore we all have a role. Doesn't the husband have a role? Doesn't the man have a role? Sure he has a role. Therefore as the church is subject to Christ, even so the wives are to be subject to their husbands in everything. Notice the words there. But husbands love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. That he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word that he might sanctify and cleanse the church because it comes from the family so we are to become this unit in Christ as Christ subjected himself to the Father and subjected himself to the cause of us to other people so we are to subject ourselves we can have this idea that we're a puppet on a string but a puppet on a string we might think is actually God's way of freedom and happiness there is a role for us to play an individual and unique role by the very nature of who we are as men and women let us take up that role and challenge as the Creator has given it to us. 
Having lost our roles, the family, and what it really means, and through social media and other things, fiddling while Rome burns and it's burning. The cool look of rebellion without commandments and structure, unguided, unloved, natural born killers, no conscience. Psalms 127 verse 3, Lo, children are the heritage of the Lord. Yet, that which is meant to be the heritage of the Lord are running the streets, are becoming criminals. They are not cared for, they are not given structure, and the cruelty and abuse that is coming through is going to reap a whirlwind. Guard your children well. This is a command from the Lord that one has responsibility and looks after his family. From the earliest point where Satan can get in, when decision making is beginning in the life, he will get in there to give a young child baggage. If he gives a child baggage at an early age, it will be hard for him to get rid of that for the rest of his life. Yet, parents, having gone through the experience of childhood, act so naively concerning the care that they should make concerning friends, associates, what they're looking at, how they're spending their time, how they're teaching them respect, how they're teaching them to look after the body. These are the heritage of the Lord and being of the Lord there is a great responsibility for these are the future of the world, of the church and if they are not cared for they will not have any future at all. The world says this, various medical and physiological benefits have been attributed to a healthy attitude to sex in general and to masturbation in particular, and no casual relationship is known between masturbation and any form of mental or physical disorder, so basically they're saying it's quite okay. It's very rare these days to find somebody who speaks against masturbation there are few and or if it's spoken of at all but this is at the very depth the very core of who we are for Christ followers masturbation is a moral decision which is over our natural inclination as is homosexuality and other issues one particular fellow ra rang up on a radio show to ask a doctor feel good if he if it was a problem he was masturbating seven times a day. Basically the answer was, in short, that shouldn't be a problem. Where was this young man's mind at? Where was his head? How would he get that high? What would that leave him physically? How would that leave him? From the earliest point in life, sexuality is a decision left to children's inclination. And this is wrong. So homosexuality is being taught in the high schools. And free sex. The decisions of a lifetime being made by children are absolutely ridiculous. Every Christian <clears throat> will have to learn to restrain his passions and be controlled by principle. Unless he does this, he is unworthy of the Christian name. The fight for life itself may be strong and severe. We are to control the senses by which sin gains entrance. The senses are blunted by sin. 1 Corinthians 6.20 For you are bought with a price, therefore glorify... God in your bodies, in your spirit, which are God's. So God has given us these joys with parameters. If we work outside of those parameters, we will make life shipwreck. If the mind is damaged, the body will be damaged too, and vice versa. 
God wants the very best for us. He speaks much more on this subject than I will put in here, but I like what it says here, Proverbs 5.18, Let thy fountain be blessed. He wants to bless us and rejoice with the wife of thy youth. Let her be as the loving hind and pleasant roe. Let her breast satisfy thee at all times, and be thou ravaged always with her love. That love that would ravish us in reality is Jesus Christ. So as we, as a, as people, as couples, as family, as church, work towards that, we will have that love ravish us that we so desire. Many people are getting overworked, unceasing care with no help at home or in the church, but rather there is constant irritation that has caused many problems. This is meant to be a joint effort. What are we doing in practical godliness? How are we lifting up the burdens of others around us in the church, in the home? Or are we just using the facilities and thinking we are an asset we are hin when we are hindering God's work? People are caught in the fast flowing waters of sin and destruction. There's a culture out there that is all about it, becoming accepted, part of the norm, finding a social <clears throat> situation which is leading us downstream to a horrible end. Situation is high rate of suicide, divorce, families breaking up, unhappiness, when in fact there's life and everything about it to live for. I think the picture says it well. An age of idiocy, media-driven debauchery, appealing to the senses and making mega profits from it. Doesn't matter about health or life, it matters about making the buck. Young men giving their lives for conflict. But this is not about national security. This is not about the homeland. This is a war abroad. But we say to young people, give your life to Christ. Wage the war on the moral front. Be part of his army. There will be sacrifice. There will be a battle. But that battle will reap rewards that will be eternal, that will be a blessing, that will not end in disaster. Nation follows nation. Like the blind leading the blind, one follows after the other. Where's the uniqueness between the nations? That they might be independent, might stand up and follow God and his word truly rather than the ideas and rules of men. To me it needs to be a change in the heart of the leaders of the nations. The unity that they seek will be under a false gospel unless they are extremely careful, unless they really seek the Lord and his commandments. People are paid for compromise. The world will pay well for that which is against the commandments of God. Many people are caught up in this, in a daily routine, in a false reality that is about a piece of paper, which of course gets you what you want for yourself, but in it the real things of life are lost. True religion true healing, a true message about health will not pay a person. You will not be paid well by the world. Pharmaceutical companies will pay well. Usury will pay well. You want to be something in life. You want to be looked up to. You want to prove that you've made it. 
we mightn't have as much as this person appears to have a great big palatial house and the right clothes and the right look and the right girl and plenty of money a lot of us have a lot less than that how many of us are prepared to keep fully his law to follow him down to the point of nothing to give everything away how many are prepared to do that the question was asked good master what shall I do to inherit eternal life and Jesus said unto him why callest thou me good none is good save one that is God thou knowest the commandments do not commit adultery do not kill do not steal do not bear false witness honor thy father and mother well he said to him I've kept all these from my youth up now when Jesus heard these things he said unto him you lack one thing sell all that you have and distribute unto the poor that thou might have treasure in heaven and come and follow me a hard saying for most in our culture today how many young people will go and follow Christ instead of the crowd how many will stand out from the crowd not look like the crowd anymore how many will have their self-worth in Christ not in what they are in their position in this world and in the exchange for labor of comforts that they have that are a sign of prestige how many can do that Jesus asked that question to us how many are prepared to give up all for me a test comes to all along the way none of us are natural born Christians you're going to meet a sinner along the way they may even think that they are Christian but they're lost along the way through circumstances their life may be wrong but what about yours are you going to give them a helping hand are you going to bring them up are you going to give them support positive feedback are you going to bring the very best out are you going to help them win people need affirmation they need hope and something to hold on to wouldn't Christ do this how did he treat the woman who was found in sin in adultery he gave her a helping hand up he gave people a chance humanity is about bloodshed about accusations no second chances grueling someone over their problems and sins and pointing fingers maybe we should talk less give more affirmation give a helping hand up how will you treat the person in the same battle do you think I would leave you dying when there is room on my horse for two this is even what this whole program here is about to bring a person up to help them to make them to the potential give them hope to be the potential that they ought to be if you have made mistakes you certainly gain a victory if you see these mistakes and regard them as beacons of warning there are regrets and everybody has regrets and in those regrets let them be warnings to us that we will not make shipwreck of life as I've said before our thoughts and feelings betray us but let us hold to the principle of that which is told to us in the Word of God not our own thoughts and feelings to experience salvation and be clean is something else altogether he's not going to wave a magical wand but the thoughts and the feelings are changed and made pure by the word and by his spirit 
we have to experiment and try by those means I just spoke of. Love requires sacrifice as the other person may not bring you the love that you dreamed of. But God will provide. We have to hold on, as I said, not by our thoughts and feelings. These will follow. But by, firstly, the command of God. When will the thoughts and feelings follow? It may take some time. But it will come. As we go into eternity, as we continue in Christ, greater shall be our experience in happiness, in enjoying his word and receiving the blessing of it. Understand this. Jesus was baptized. The Father spoke of his beloved Son in whom he was well pleased. The Spirit ascended on him in the form of a dove. And straightway he was driven into the wilderness to be tempted. He did this for our sakes. Because when we are baptized, immersed in him straightway, Satan, having lost the victory, looks to regain those he once held and brings them into severe places. And the test will be given again. To whom will I give my loyalty? It will be on every front that Satan can get an opening. He will attack that person. Beware of his attacks. Beware that he will get you when weak and vulnerable. And what he wants to do is discourage you. That discouragement means that you will start to leave that decision that you made for Christ. You need to get back on even if you have fallen. You need to get back on and persist in prayer and turning to Christ and persist and persist and persist. In persistence, in turning again and again, in changing the media that you are in, that which surrounds you, the thoughts, the music, what you are viewing, what you are listening to, you can, by beholding, become changed. Persist in Christ. Our Heavenly Father, what a wonderful thing to be able to call Him the one and only true God, the one at the center of the universe. We can speak directly to Him, our Heavenly Father. He has a thousand ways to provide for us of which we know nothing. Those who accept the one principle of making the service of God supreme will find perplexities vanish and a plain path before their feet. You can be happy in Him if you're all alone. If you had not another friend in the wide world, you can find happiness in Him because you believe your word, his word, and that word becomes a reality to you, here beside you to guide you and help you. There is a line drawn in the sand. That line is the commandments of God. To the law and to the testimony, if they speak not according to this word, there is no light in them. So to stay within that line, we need to have a different culture, a different media. We need to have a little sanctuary of our own that God will bless. All heaven is interested in our salvation. It would seem perhaps to us unfair what we go through. But we have a high priest, one who is touched with all the feelings of our infirmities, our weakness, our temptations, tempted in all points like we, longing for something better, 
deciding whether to go through with his death the agony that he must face for all humanity's sake he longed for purity he longed for peace in the world around him where there was trouble and sin but he went through all of this that at the end of the travail of his soul he would see the reward now for us there is the travail of our soul but at the end there is re the reward but once we have faith in his word that he is by our side that we can trust him at all points in difficult times when we are abased when we are at full and plenty when we have little or nothing this is how Paul spoke at all times I will trust in him even though he slay me yet will I trust in him this is the attitude that we have to have by faith we believe that the temptation brings out a stronger character a stronger person ready for the gates of heaven